Hiya, yeah, uh, Stuart Johnson, um, farm in Hexham, Northumberland. Um, being asked to come along today uh, just to share my experiences. Um, that doesn't look right, but that's fine, never mind. Uh, I haven't cracked it at all. I um, have made loads of efforts and attempts over the last few years to do it. Um, what works for us does work for us, but there's no suggestion it'll work for you. So two, uh, two of my favorite things is do your own research, know your own context, KYOC. That's um, definitely very important. Um, I'm going to share my experiences. Hopefully, you might get something out of it. If you don't, that's fine as well. Just smile and nod with me. Um, <laughs> We are a family-run farm and business in Tyne Valley, Northumberland. Um, we, uh, we have about 540 acres, which has been fairly long-term regeneratively farmed. Um, 280 um, acres just taken on a few years ago that we've sort of introduced practices to, and 220 that we just uh, do in line with the landlord's wishes at, two, at, uh, at conventionally managed. Um, we are livestock farmers. We can grow our own arable, but we don't really have a massive passion for it, uh, a bit of knowledge on it, but we really are livestock farmers through and through. That's what we like doing. Um, generally, we have about 170 cows that carve a year, um, about 800 yows. They fluctuate up and down, depends on the season and the graze and all that sort of stuff. So um, it just depends on what's happening. Um, soil type, we are, we are light sand and gravel predominantly. We have a bit of uh, a bit of medium loam, will you, you might say, further on. Um, we do have a couple of fell fields that are wet, but generally we're probably on the drier side. And that would be our unfair advantage, I think, um, in terms of this. Um, 10 years ago, 12, 15 years ago, we were super high input. That's what we like doing. Loved putting on fertilizers, chemicals, um, you name it. We wanted to maximize output. Um, so we were high input, high output. What, what we wanted to do was, was breed the best, grow the most uh, and really sort of um, really, really make an effort to do that. And that was our passion, I guess, at the time, or, or we thought it was. Um, did not consider soil health very much at all at the time. Um, around 2012, wanted to make some changes. All of it was for financial reasons. Um, just wanted to save the establishment costs, save the, save the inputs. Uh, the secondary appreciation, shall we say, of the inputs came much later on, um, but they are very abundant now. Um, so, uh, picture there is me and my family. That's why we do it. Um, that's why we're here. We, yes, we were conventional and we possibly not as much now, but we do it and we, we need to provide for the family. So that's why we, we all want to do that. We all want to, we all want to have a good thriving business. So that's the, that's the priority in our lives. Um, so why change? Um, business resilience, that was essentially my thing. Love resilience in the business, be it financial, climactic, any of it. I want to mitigate our reliance on other people, our 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 vulnerability to whatever may come along. Um, fertilizer prices go up; doesn't really matter to us now. Doesn't it's, it's not an issue. Um, you know, we just we just do what we do, and hopefully we're we're away from it. Um, wanted to do it early before we were forced to do it. I was trying to be slightly more proactive. Um, wanted to use that BPS as a bit of a buffer when it was there. Um, uh, it does make financial sense, but we wanted to try and make sure that we, we used that sort of um, that window of opportunity, shall we say, when payments were still there, and we could we could try stuff, um, which is good. Um, I have a young family. I used to work. I don't know how many, a lot of hours. Um, I didn't want to do that forever. I wanted to find a way of doing it. A um, couple of little memes there. I'm sure you've seen them in the past. That's what farmers think is normal, just to work every hour under the sun. And I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to, I wanted to find a way that allowed us to have time with our family and, and grow up with them. Um, healthy livestock and environment, it's a no-brainer. Why wouldn't you want that? Um, morally, it's the right thing to do. I always put that with a question mark. That's entirely up to yourselves as to whether you think it is or not. Personally, I think if there's a better way of doing it, why wouldn't you? Um, so hopefully that's, a, that's, that's an important thing. I will, I will have to sort of put down there, we are, we, are, we are still seeing ourselves as production farmers. We are still producing high quantities of produce, hopefully just more nutrient dense now. Um, initially, back in 2012, nobody else wanted to take part in any sort of change. <laughs> it was just me, um, mother, father, brother. They were all, I wouldn't say happy with the system, but it was good. We all had a good system going. We didn't do it because we were short of money or we weren't working. We just I wanted to make these changes for those above reasons. Um, 
So it was a case of trying things small and steady to begin with. It was a real slow burn. Um, making little changes, get a little win, um, and then be cheap when you're doing it. If you go and spend a great whack on something and then it turns out to be wrong, that is going to go down badly. So, uh, so for me, it was definitely about going slowly, bringing the team along with us, um, and we have just about got there now. Um, we're singing off the same hymn sheet. I say to people, we're not actually singing the same notes very often, but we are definitely singing off the same hymn sheet now. Um, so those first few years, um, Scattergun didn't really have a proper direction of what we were doing. I was trying things. Um, we went to a, a Claydon drill um, just to try things. We all, initially it was all arable land, went to the Claydon drill, utilised some monoculture cover crops, all with the same conventional inputs. I was just trying to just basically save money. That's all we were trying to do. Um, there was no real consideration for the soil, again, still at that time. Um, but what was becoming really apparent was when we were getting successes, that, was, that seemed to be on the land that had the high organic matters, had, 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 the, had the better um, microbiology in it. Um, and it was about 2017, we got to a little bit of a crossroads and thought, right, are we going to keep going down this route or are we going to deviate back to conventional, which is possibly slightly more consistent, shall we say? Um, chose, the, chose the former, decided to ed educate ourselves, learn, understand, um, something that possibly had done previously, but not particularly well, shall we say? Um, and about that time came across regenerative agriculture. Um, and in the words of Gabe Brown, became intentional with it. So we wanted to go out and actually do it. And, and we went about stuff with a purpose rather than just trying things and winging it. We actually made a bit of a plan and, and went about it um, method methodologically, method um, whatever you want to say. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, increasing knowledge. I'm not going to preach to you, you all know all these. Um, it's come on massively over the last few years, but my particular favorite source one's there. Um, understanding ag's been a real, um, a real help throughout all of this with us. Um, I used to look at a lot of Graham Sayet I listened to, sorry, Graeme Sitt and Joel Williams, who were good with sort of um, amendments to help us through the process, but I didn't see an end to the amendments, which I didn't like that. So I wanted to go sort of further on. So we went to, I think, understanding ag, that was the real bit where we, uh, where we sort of really made some progress with things. Um, love David Montgomery going to revolution, if you haven't read it, that is brilliant. Um, so 2018 onwards, I uh, went into it with with a bit more intent about us, trying to be, rather than just saying we were doing some good things, we decided to go out and actually do some bloody good things. Um, clarity and direction came from the understanding ag, the four ecosystem processes. Um, that is driven by the six principles and the three rules. So that allows us to try and question ourselves all the time as to what we're doing, is it the right thing to do? Um, the whole mindset change, I don't use the word holistic, because if you talk to a conventional man, it, very quickly puts them off any sort of a conversation. But we do look at things from a holistic approach. Uh, the whole, try and see it as a whole now. Um, I don't think I'd even considered the importance of livestock in the system at that time and how important it was, the grazing wise. Um, so once we brought that sort of extra element into it, that's when things really sort of fast tracked through. Um, now we spend five years building our fertility account up on the legume and herbage pastures to get two years of arable out of them. Um, all that's for our home self seed, uh, home saved, sorry, use it ourselves, but we don't, we used to go 180 eggs of arable, but we're down to sort of 70 now because we're just not feeding it very much anymore or using it. So again, things have changed and we're just moving away from where we used to be. Um, we also came in with a slightly more positive mental attitude because some members of the team hadn't had one to that point. So, uh, <laughs> So we, we all sort of said, let's, let's do it and let's do it properly. And, uh, and, I, and I think it has paid dividends doing that. Um, Long-term strategies, what do we actually focus on? Um, costings and financials. I'm a financials man. I love crunching numbers. I love looking at stuff. I love the, the nerdiness of it all. Um, but I also love trying to find a profitable business, specifically a profitable suckler cow herd. That is my real sort of passion with it all. Um, what else did we do? We wanted to understand our context better, our environment, our unfair advantage, which has been often your unfair advantage is something that you've complained about for years, but actually it turns out it's pretty good. So we picked stones for years, but actually stones are very good at holding cattle up in the winter. 
so we can outwinter quite well at our place. Um, diversity, wanted to put that into everything. Doesn't matter what you're talking about in terms of environment, uh, business, sort of enterprises, whatever you want to think that the, the multi-species swords, we want to put that in everywhere. Got rid of the Caladon, it wasn't enough, went full no-till. We look at the 634 and everything that we do now. Every discussion we have sort of comes back around to thoughts of is this going to benefit what we're trying to do or are we, are we deviating slightly. Uh, the 5-2 rotation, five years Legume and Herbridge Sward and then two years Arable. So we basically build up that fertility bank account and then we cash out the interest for a couple of years. Never below where we started, um, but we do utilise it still. Um, whether we'll keep doing arable forever is a completely different question, but we'll, we'll find out. Um, observations, that is something that I don't think I've ever really taken seriously before, but to sit and actually observe and to, to make sure what we're doing is the right thing, um, that's crucial through this whole thing, um, especially looking for indicated species or indicator uh, events that you might see. So it's, it's important for us. So that was one of the things we said. And continual development is essentially we're never going to get to where we, we want it. Well, we can get near it, but we're never going to hit perfection, but we're going to keep striving to get there. So hopefully one day we'll, we'll slow down and find out. <laughs> Short term, looked at a few things, um, mostly because as farmers who've especially come from such a high uh, conventional system, we can't help thinking that we need to be doing something. So it makes you feel a little bit better if you're doing something. So we looked at the soil, calcium, magnesium ratios and pH levels. That was all really looked at to do with the soil. Um, put them right if they needed it. Uh, plants, we follow the plants with uh, leaf tissue tests and brick le bricks levels. Um, then we apply, or we did, apply nutritional foliar feeds. We did this for sort of four or five years. Um, I don't tend to do it very much now. It was more of a process that we went through to give ourselves the confidence it was working. Uh, same with the brewing. Used to brew up a lot and splash it on everywhere and it was, it was good. I, I think it did help drive the system forward. Um, I have since come to the conclusion, I don't think you can get any better benefits than livestock grazed in the right way. But if, if you want to brew, whether it's for a you know, mental reason or whether you, you think that you need to stimulate something, there is benefits to doing it. I just wouldn't sort of do it all the time or want to rely on it forever. Essentially, you're just going to replace one input with another if you do that. Um, we have used our anaerobic microbes in the past. I'm good at expanding them. I use them for silage additive now mainly, but we, you know, it's quite good for, for using them in some places. Um, where we've got to, I won't bore you with the details of this. It's very much just, you know, you've all, you've all probably made significant strides like this anyway, so it's, um, it's not worth getting too much into, but I think essentially what the point I'm trying to make is where we were and where we've come to feels like a staggeringly big difference. Um, and I think that in that, sh what, felt like a long time but actually isn't that long a time I think you know it, it does feel like quite a good success um, nitrogen for example we used to use sort of 70 to 90 tons a year and we're down to sort of nine tons now and that's only on the arable ground um, so we have substantially reduced just about every variable costs hopefully without over sacrificing the yield um, we were lucky enough to hold uh, to host understanding ag on the farm in October um, and I've just come back from America with a two-week spell with them out there, which was wonderful. Um, they were every bit as good as I hoped they'd be. So um, if you get the chance, do go. Um, these are some thoughts I never have. Uh, sorry, thoughts I thought I never thought I'd have. So 15 years ago, uh, never thought any of that would be true, especially the sheep one. Um, but the mindset does change through this. So it's quite interesting how 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 different we are and how different our farming is now. Um, but it's nice, it's a, it's a nice way to farm. Um, last slide, I've noted through this, so that's good. Uh, key points that I do think for, for us, for our farm, it's not one size fits all. We've tried a lot of stuff that other people advocated and said would work, um, and it, was, it, was, it had varying results. Um, it's, it's all about finding what works for you in your context. Uh, don't be too um, evangelical about any of it because that can be exceptionally uh, depressing when things don't go right. So try and, try and ride off the good things and, and take note of the good things and just put those bad things to the back. Um, margin not yield is an absolute killer, top of the list, I think, in terms of get your head around the fact that it took a lot for our farm as well. Getting your head around the fact we didn't need to get everything. We don't need to get every last little bit out of the arable field, say, 
if we've got a break-even point on the margin of, of, the, of an arable crop of a tonne an acre or less, we don't need to punt for four tonne by hauling fertiliser on. We'll just take that less yield and be happy that we're still making more money than the man over the river who's, who needs three and a half to break even. So that mindset change is, is huge. Um, compounding cascading effects is crucial as well. The whole idea that you make a decision and that's, it's not going to impact on anything else later on is, is, it's not just wrong, it's very difficult to get your head around. Whereas in reality, whatever you do will have, an, in, uh, will have a knock on effect. So what we try and do is make sure that the, the knock on effect is a compound and positive one rather than a cascading one. Um, and that leads on to the short term wins. If, short term wins over, over long term. We always like to think long term now. If our crops don't look very good and we're going to slop some nitrogen on, of course they'll look better and they will, they will react to that. But at what cost will that be for the year after or for the, for the next crop? So we now look at it sort of a, we'll take what's gone there and, and we'll, we'll, we'll bank that little bit of resilience that we've built up there for the following year, um, which, which is a lot easier, um, but it feels a lot better as well. Um, we try to generally understand the plant soil relationship. My dad, is 60 plus. He uh, said to me many times, I don't think I'll ever understand this. And I've said to him many times, you don't really have to understand it, just understand the principles and the, you don't need to know the science. It, it's, there's too many people making this too complex and too complicated for us. Um, whereas in reality, if you just follow the, the nice simple principles, it's gonna flow and it's gonna, it's gonna work itself out if we just sort of get out the way a little bit. So, um, Bring your positive mental attitude. It's going to be really tested a lot of the time. Um, observe key. I've already said it's, it's super important. The 634 and definitely try not to worry what the neighbours think because there will be a lot of comments. So it's been a thing. So that's me. Thank you. Just um, any questions for Stuart? Oh, sorry. What are you doing at the end? Yet. What are you doing at the end? Hi, Stuart. Uh, well done. Uh, very good talk, that, and very interesting. Um, what was the catalyst in your mind that made you change? Because I think that is one of the biggest problems facing agriculture at the moment, is people willing to change. And then just at the end there, it says, try not to worry what the neighbours think. Are those neighbours actually embracing anything that you're doing or are they looking over the wall and, and trying some things um what was the first one again so what was the catalyst the catalyst i think it was just purely i think someone we used to get a contractor in to, to drill for us and he came in one day and and it was actually the lad driving for him so it wasn't the contract himself and he said oh you could your land's light enough you could just drill straight into this and i was just seeing the pound size thinking let's do that then and then we'll just save some money it's only when you sort of look at, explore how to save some money and then try a few things that you suddenly realise that the importance of that soil and, and how we've neglected that importance for years. Um, so it's a bit like once you've gone down the rabbit's warren, it's very difficult to, to, to come back round in good conscience. So um, once I started looking at it and trying to understand it, 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 it didn't feel right to not do it. So... Um, that was probably the main reasons why um, it was purely financial. I, I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. It was purely financial at the time. And, and, and a lot of our business is still financially driven, but it's done with the environment in mind now, hopefully. Um, and the second question, neighbours. Yeah, there's a big, there's a little group of us now sort of all trying different things. I wouldn't say direct neighbours. I'd say the more sort of maybe friends and family who've discussed stuff with, who, who got more time rather than looking at a field full of flowers and not really understanding what we're doing, but if you can have a conversation, it, it sort of very quickly opens up a, a, a dialogue and everyone understands why stuff's happening. I think that entices people into it more. Um, I think my dad struggled with it the most. I think it's a generational thing. I think that a lot of farmers spent all the time with farmers. Um, so his, his social group was based around farmers and they're all doing the same thing. If you try and move out of that, I think he got a lot of questions and flack that I, I'm not that bothered. I kind of just, it doesn't matter to me. I don't, I, I don't tend to have, the farm's not my social hub, as it were. So um, it's quite easy for me to shrug my shoulders and ignore people. Whereas if that's your social, social um, 
social context, it's really difficult to, to push past that. But it now seems to be more people asking questions in actual interest rather than offhand comments, you know. So I think he, he's a lot more comfortable with it now than he maybe was 10 years ago. So it's a, it's a really positive thing. So. Chris. Thanks, you. Could you tell us a bit more about 634 and also what you um, gained from talks to understanding AG? Okay, so the 634, I'll go back to the thing. Um, basically, the four ecosystem processes, they're, they're driven by the, the energy flow, water cycle, mineral cycle, diversity. Now, I think that's a savory thing. Someone can correct me if that's wrong. I think that's a savory thing. I think, he's, I think it's, a, it's right. It has everything ticks the boxes. It's right. I think that, and this is my personal opinion, so don't any savoury people come after me. I think where savoury slightly fell down was that he didn't guide people enough on how to achieve that. Um, and understand that I have these six principles and three rules that are a lot more simplistic to follow or they have a sort of direction that allows people to refer back to them rather than just winging it a little bit under the savoury way. Um, so it just... It gives a bit of a consistency or a comforting, um, a comforting level of reference point to keep going back to. Um, so that's that's sort of for someone who doesn't have a lot of uh, planning in his life. It's quite good for me to be able to sit down and say, Actually, "Hang on a second, are we are we are we doing the right thing here?" And it's good in a conversation to sort of refer back to it and say, "Well, hang on, is this the is this the correct thing to do here?" Um, and it's a good point for someone like my father who isn't going to understand the science now and why should he? He's 60, why would he want to sit down and relearn a whole, a whole lifetime work? Um, but if he, he, if he knows the principles are going, to, are going to be the right thing to do, he doesn't necessarily need to know the science, like I say, so it's just a really simple and simple good reference point to keep going back to. So, does that answer the question? Do, what do they do for you? What do Understanding Ag do for you? Uh, nothing in terms of... <laughs> they don't... They don't I, I don't employ Understanding Ag or anything like that. We, we, uh, we've been introduced and had conversations. Um, they are part of a, pr a mentoring program, um, which, is, which is through um, the Regenerate lot over there. Um, so there they're involved as the mentoring in that. So they are exceptionally good for guidance and helping out. So I've been used as a bit of a pilot farm for this regenerate asset management who are, who are trying to develop this scheme and they've used our farm as a sort of base point to see how it's helping things or not helping things and vice versa. So understanding Ag have been brought in as the mentoring uh, side of that. Um, so <laughs> when I say nothing, it's not specifically they don't do nothing. They've been fantastic at driving it forward. It's just... Um, it's just they aren't specifically on farm or anything like that doing that. It's just being able to draw from that knowledge base all the time is really, really helpful. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's good. Does Alex have a question? <laughs> this is the final question. <laughs> Stuart, thanks for your presentation. You, you made a fairly controversial point halfway through that you, you now find sheep enjoyable. <laughs> <laughs> Can you explain the evolution you've made to your system to get yourself <laughs> there? Uh, uh, I don't like sheep. Um, so, and I specifically did not like the way we did sheep. Um, lambing everything through the shed, um, punting for 230% lambing percentages, uh, feeding them all winter, uh, the whole thing. It, it didn't sit well with me, and I think that I think that finding a different way suddenly has made it slightly more enjoyable. So now we we don't feed them any concentrate; they're on legume and herbage swords, just just grazed every all through the winter. Um, we don't aim for that big scanning anymore. We aim for you know 175, 180. That'll do. We lamb outside, which is a lot more rewarding. It's a lot more enjoyable. Um, they're just slightly more fun than they used to be. Um, <laughs> still don't like sheep, though. Uh, they, um, I will say that 
the sheep have had to change to suit the system since we started. So we, we sort of set to with the generally mules is what we had, um, but they won't suit the system. They don't, they don't like grazing. They're not forage based. They can't. So we've moved to an innovative sheep, um, varying breeds. I wouldn't say that they're all perfect, but they're a better starting point um, because they have been bred to, bred to go off forage. Um, and they do carry the, the, the fat and condition a lot better. So um, having more simplistic sheep has definitely helped uh, and in a simplistic system. Just means I'm not weighing sheep every day or, or, or doing feet. So it's a lot more fun. Perfect. Thank you, Stuart. So next up is Bruce. So straight over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Bruce Thompson, and as you can tell from my accent, I'm a, I'm from Ireland. I'm a dairy farmer. Um, so if you just stick with the accent, I promise you, before we go home this evening, I'll have you all speak in Irish. Um, so yeah, from the land of saints and scholars, and for reasons we're not going to get into. I certainly won't be a saint. I might, if I got into it, we might have to talk to, to Sarah Langford. Um, so at a stage in my life, I decided um, that I'd, I'd like to become an Uffield scholar. Um, so that encouraged me to, um, to go and, and look at what issues we were having in, in our industry at home. Um, so I, I initially looked at antelmintic resistance um, and took me down a rabbit hole of dung beetles. Um, by traveling all around the world to some of these exotic places. Um, so, how do we work this thing? Oh, that's not mine. There we go. So, it wouldn't be a PowerPoint presentation without a boring graph. Um, i just putting this up to show you that uh, the compar oh. systems in, in UK are com very comparable to back home in Ireland, same grass growth and rainfalls, in general speaking. So, it's, it's very relatable. Um, and this is a confusogram. Um, <laughs> I'll try to understand this. Um, so basically, um, what I want to show you is that, that the, the type of system we're running on the farm now uh, it has to fit in to the parameters of our KPIs. I, I make no apologies that I want to make money on my farm. I have a mortgage and I'm, I'm married with two kids, so it has to make financial sense. But it's what I can do within that system and that doesn't affect my key performance indicators, um, that can actually benefit the environment. So just showing that this is not affecting our, um, our, one of our KPIs, one of the main ones, is our fertility rates. And if you pick out the figure down, figures one and two down at the bottom, it's the, it's the uh, submission rates for fertility, which would be the first thing to be hit on, on a farm if animals are stressed. Um, so basically, we're, we're well above the, the national average in there, so it's... In other words, it's, what we're doing is not affecting. Wrong way. Right. So, um, looking at the parasite management on farms, um, we spent three generations looking at the stages five, six, seven, and eight, which is the um, stages within the host. <laughs> but um, almost 90% of the parasites on any farm at any given time are out on pasture which is where we haven't been looking at managing them. So instead of parasite control, we're now looking at parasite management because we can't actually control parasites. It's taken us three generations to figure that out. Um, so um, I robbed this slide from Moore Park, which is our advisory research center in, in Cork. And on a trial done in uh, last year, um, they found resistance to the tree wormer groups that we have. All, we have different products, but there's three wormer groups. Um, they found resistance on, you can see the number of farms, 15 on white. Uh, there was 60% of those were resistant, and so on and so forth. So all 16 farms had resistance to clear, which is our ivermectin. So basically, ivermectin's shot. So it's not working. Um, and that's, that's our advisory service. It's state-funded. It's, it's completely independent. Um, so back home. Um, Changing our approach, um, our cows are 
they're a fantastic animal. Um, the word vaccine comes from the word vaca, which is Latin for cow. And uh, the first vaccine, smallpox vaccine, used cows to create it. Um, because they're really fantastic creatures, are building resistance, um, their own resistance and immunity. So we have been leaving them a bit lazy over the last number of generations and not actually letting them get um, exposed to parasites. We've just stayed worming them. Um, so we are uh, looking at exposure versus immunity on the farm, and it's a matter of getting that in balance. Um, our stock have two types of immunity, it's adaptive or innate, and um, the adaptive one is the low-hanging fruit here. That's the one that they'll create over time. Um, however, our calves, they are, that's our young stock, calves and lambs, they're the most susceptible, but they're also, they're the ones that would contaminate pasture at a far higher rate. Uh, to put it into context, we have 300 milking cows at home. Um, I did fecal egg counting, I looked and I looked, and I found one egg out of the 300 cows. I tested one calf, had 2,400 eggs in the sample. So it puts into con context that one calf, the damage it's doing. And then wh where are these, where and when are these parasites? So we can see that we, they don't really become a thing on pasture until mid to late summertime. So why are we worming early in the season? And you can see that the, the blue mark here is um, that's the uh, faecal egg count of lambs. So you can see that rises as the season goes on. So there's, there's really, there's absolutely no need to worrying so much about parasites early in the season. Um, and on the herbage here, we can see um, where they actually are. So this, this is a perennial ryegrass. And we can see down, down in the bottom, five, six centimeters. That's where the, the large number of infective stage larvae are sitting. Um, so grazing animals down tight um, is going to lead to more more ingestion of parasites. So that's why we, uh, we don't graze tight with the calves when they go out, in, particularly in the early, early part of the season. We skip them over the paddocks pretty lightly and uh, move them regularly is, is important. And I threw in a picture of my dog there because I think he looks brilliant. Uh, <laughs> that's for reference. <laughs> that, that is a dog, it's not a Jersey cross. Yeah. <laughs> so, we, as, as they move around then, they're, they're obviously contaminating the pasture with, with these high egg counts, um, potentially. So we developed a grazing system called traffic light grazing, and that's where we're mapping the risks on pasture throughout the year. Calves go out early in the season, we're giving them low risks because we, we, we don't want them getting overwhelmed. And as the season goes on then, we start um, putting them out onto medium risk pasture. Um, that is confirmed then with faecal egg counting and animal performance. We also write down the parasite that we're dealing with on the map as well. So it's lungworm. We don't have to worry about lungworm in, in the early half of the season. Um, it's not till the season gets on that that becomes an issue. Um, moving them re very regularly. And this is my cheap conveyor belt um, feeder. They're moved. Uh, we, we, there's, there's an old train of thought, uh, grow it in three weeks and, and graze it in three days. Now, we, we do give longer than three weeks. We're working on a 28-day rotation with calves, um, but they, they don't get a, um, a huge um, allocation of grass. Um, and, um, yeah, we've no designated calf paddock. So that was, that's a big downfall on a, on a lot of livestock farms that we have this well-fenced paddock that's ideal for letting calves out to and it's easy access and the trough is in the corner. Um, but we, we move away from that, making all the equipment mobile and uh, keeping the calves on, on virgin grass the whole time. So then to clean it up, we use hoovers. So there's our, um, uh, a more, or more uh, re resilient type of livestock. So um, older animals in particular, they're, they're able to ingest parasites, um, particularly when they've built up immunity um, without actually um, letting them multiply in, in their stomachs. So, and a mo uh, baler then is another fantastic way of cleaning up pasture to leave it ready for young stock. And here is, um, this is, uh, this is Cooperia, I think. It's, um, this is parasites under a microscope. We're doing our own faecal egg counting on our farm. It's not something I'd recommend. Um, vets and labs uh, provide the same service, but 
the point is to get it done. It's cheap to get it done. I'm going to get it done, and um, it'll help your decision making, and it'll help um, identify what paddocks are potentially getting um, contaminated more. So when we do those, um, we identify the, the product that we're going to use based on the lab results um, and the right time, so we know when to go in with it. Um, very important to get the, the, the calculation correct on the, on the equipment. And refugia, so this is very important. 80% um, of the parasites are in 20% of the animals. So we need to find that 20% and concentrate on them. Um, so we're using the weighing scales and looking at performance and using a, a targeted selective treatment with them. Um, and we're recording that information. Um, we're actually at a point now on a farm, we've finished expanding, that we're going to start selecting animals based on their um, innate resistance to parasites. Because there's some animals on my farm never, have never seen a wormer, and that's within a conventional uh, grass-based system. So after they've been wormed, they go out, we have a little corner in the field, we, we fence that off and give it, to the, give it to the calves. They stay on that for two or three days, and they're moved off it again. It's only ever used at that moment in time after worming. Um, and then afterwards, we put them onto a medium risk paddock, which sounds counterintuitive, but we want those animals to fill back up with susceptible parasites that are susceptible to the wormers. Um, that means we're not breeding resistant parasites on our farm. Uh, quarantine drench. So I call this the, the napalm approach. So. <laughs> No, no, the room, Bruce. Um, <laughs> when we bring livestock in, into our farm, um, to, to make sure that we don't bring in resistant parasites onto our farm, we, we keep those animals in quarantine and are given all three worm groups. That is because if we have, as you saw from the, one of the first slides there, if we have a, um, a parasite that is resistant to a particular product, another one will take it out. And that means that down, down the road, we can worm less. If you're only bringing in a small number of animals, it's a very good way of, of ensuring sustainability. And then they're turned back out onto a wormy paddock to make sure that they fill back up with, with, um, with parasites. T uh, so it is my opinion that fly control products are probably more harmful than wormers to, um, to biodiversity, which I'm going to get into in a minute, how this all ties in. So we, we stay away from deltrametrin and cypermetrin products, which are basically, um, that's your spot-ons and your pour-on, your, your conventional flight control products. We use, try to use Stockholm Tower. This year, admittedly, we, we failed. It's the first time in, in a number of years we did. We had to go in with the bottle of stuff, which I'll hang my head in shame over, but we did it. But that's, that's what we normally use, is the Stockholm Tower. Battles is the best one, by the way, uh, and I'm not on any gratuity there. Uh, come, come speak to me afterwards. <laughs> but they, their, their product seems to stick on a lot better than, than other ones. So this leads me on to dung beetles. This is where it all ties in. So there's, there's two main types in the UK. There's dwellers and tunnelers. And um, they're a, a beneficial insect agriculture. I'm going to show you why. Um, they are nature's recyclers. So they will, you can see um, you have bur the burrowers there pulling the, um, the dung in, into the ground, taking it off of the, the topsoil where it's, it's a noxious weed sitting on top and they put it in at the grassroots where it's a, a, a nutrient um, a rich product at, at the roots of the grassland. Um, there's a very rough guide on, on beetles, that's up on our, on our website there as well. Uh, Dungbeetlesforfarmers.co.uk uh, we don't have the rollers that you see on the David Attenborough type films or documentaries. So the benefits to farmers then, show me the money. Parasite and fly reductions. Um, so what the main species of dung beetles we have, the, the aphodines, the dwellers, they actually dry the dung pats and they move around the dung pats. Flies, flies that are, are dung born um, require a very specific set of, of um, a very specific set of environmental rules, and if you start moving that around at all, like the dung beetles do, it, it destroys them from being able to, to migrate 
out off of the, the dung pot. Um, better nutrient recycling, that's pretty obvious. So, uh, soil aeration with the, the tunnelers. So if, if there was a machine uh, that could be bought to do what the tunnelers do, we'd all buy one. Um, the, the boreholes down into the ground, down to a metre deep, and uh, increase the aeration of, of the soil. Um, reduce pasture fouling. So when you're removing the, the dung pats off of the pasture, it's leaving um, more grass available to, to the animals. And what they really do then in drying out the pat and drinking the pat, they're making it more attractive to earthworms. So these earthworms then will pull it into the soil, and they're the ones that really actually pull it into the ground eventually. Um, they're also a transport service for beneficial mites, and you'll see one of those in the picture in a second. Um, these mites actually eat fly eggs, um, so, uh, but they can't actually migrate from one dung pat to another without the use of a dung beetle because they're so small. So the benefits to the environment then, so in, in, in removing this dung from on top of the soil and putting it into, into, the, into the soil at the roots, it, re it reduces the risk of, of nutrients leaching into the waterways. But the real, real uh, one that, that appeals to me is the, that they're f the fact that they're a food source for um, birds, bats, um, foxes, and um, uh, badgers, which is a hard word for me to say, as you probably heard there. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm caught with TB at the moment, so yeah, it's a love-hate relationship. But anyway, we're working through it. Um, um, so this is, a, this is a fox cat, and you can see the remnants of dung beetles in it. So it shows you that they really do feast on them. Um, so it's uh, another benefit. So I, part of my Nuffield, I travelled down to South Australia and Tasmania. Um, and the reason I went there is they had to artificially introduce dung beetles um, because white man landed with his cattle and sheep back in the late 1700s and they didn't bring the dung beetles with them. And the dung beetles that were in Australia had evolved around marsupials, so your kangaroos and your koala bears. And it, this, these big wet dung pats from the cattle and sheep appeared and it took one bite out of them and decided that it tasted like shit. So, <laughs> so that, that turned into a, a problem. Initially, it was a, an urban problem. Uh, so, you know, the, the, our, our stereotypical Australian with the cork hang, corks hanging from the hat, that was because of the bush fly who, um, um, yeah, really propagated uh, like wildfire in these, these dung pats that, that took about three to four years to disintegrate. You can see the bottom right picture there. That's, that's a field I visited in an area that had no, no dung beetles introduced yet. Um, so they're still doing it. They started back in the, the late 50s, I think it was, and they're still at it. So you can see some of the species, what, what they're able to achieve. That top right picture, that is from a species called spinager, Geotrupis spinager, which is here in the UK. So it's not, uh, it's not something that we can't achieve here. Um, Five minutes, perfect. Right, um, fresh dung pat. This is in an incubator at home because everyone does those sort of things. Um, <laughs> introduced by dung beetles. This is 72 hours later, completely burrowed into the soil. And here is uh, a bit of messing around I did with a plastic bucket to see how deep they go. And I was told that the bucket wasn't deep enough. So that's how far down. You can see what they actually do. And there's the little chambers that they lay the lady eggs in. So declining population, um, why is that? Drug usage, removing animals from pasture, high grain diets, and the dung pats from Bruce's cows from his perennial ryegrass swords, and pasture harrowing and tilling. All those things are, are th things that dung beetles don't like. So we are in trouble in, in, in this part of the world with dung beetles. Um, so what I was doing to revert it, that in my own farm was uh, capturing beetles and reproducing them on my own farm. So there's, if you look closely at that picture, you can see the little mites climbing all over the beetles. Um, so catch the beetles and artificially uh, get them to re um, reproduce at a higher rate. There's some of them in field tents and some of them in, in incubator, incubators. Um, <laughs> thanks very much. <laughs> Go Liverpool. 
<laughs> um, so uh, yeah, no, it is it is quite laborious, and I had to I have to admit I, I took a leaf out of Matt's book and employed um, some child labour to 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 speed up the process. But um, yeah, that's basically the the dung beetles, and this is the show me the money part again. Um, this is on my own farm, and uh, last year this is what we spent on wormers. Um, conventional approach, and this is our, uh, what we're at. So there, there's over three grand of a saving there um, to be made. Um, right, so the, the Irish bit. Um, repeat after me. Whale. Whale. Oil. Oil. Beef. 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 Hooked. Hooked. Now, re say that again very fast in an Irish accent. <laughs> Go. Thank you very much. Through a bit more detail of the collecting and di like breeding the beetles, like what were the orange things and yeah, what was going on there? Yeah, okay. So I suppose it's hard to get into the detail, um, but yeah. Um, so it, what we have to do is uh, we're, we're looking at timings, we're looking at topography, and where animals are. So anim like they the come from dung pat fields, of dung pats. You're looking at wind direction, and th they were put in a line, and those traps were put in a line. Um, that was uh, perpendicular to the to prevailing wind at the time. And there's, there's pitfall traps there. Now, they're, they're specially made pitfall traps that don't utilize them. Um, so yeah, you, you, you basically end up with the, a lot of the beetles. They, they, they fly zigzag to where the scent is, and they'll land into the middle traps, uh, sp uh, mostly. Yeah, And then what you're trying to do to get them to repopulate um, is you're putting them into an enclosed environment and you're fooling them into thinking that there's a shortage of food because uh, dung pats currently, you know, if there's two dung beetles in it, it's like a retirement home. You know, they might get on with it at some point, you know, they're kind of very relaxed, but if, <laughs> if, uh, if you chuck in a load of them, it turns, and it turns into Glastonbury. So you, want, you, know, that you end up with, with fighting going on and they're, they're, um, yeah, they, they start laying more eggs and reproduce at a higher rate. Um, but you have to stay feeding that process then. It's like a plague of locusts you're trying to recreate with dung beetles. So that's... Hi, hi Bruce, thanks, that was fantastic. Um, I think we're pretty sorted on our worming strategy at home, but um, we do have ticks and so we are using Crovex still, but I see you've got um, eucalyptus oil up there. Is that just for flies, or um, have you got anything, do you have any kind of hot answers on how to deal with ticks, because they will just decimate worms? Yeah, t ticks are a bit of an issue, all right, um, and that's something I have to um, deal with too much, to be honest. So um, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into it too much, because I'm not an expert on ticks, to be honest. But I, I, I know it with lice, I found very effective um, to shave their backs and put, we use cubicle lime on them, uh, which is, uh, I think it's about 20% hydrated and 80% ground limestone. And that stops lice, if that's any good to you. Eucalyptus oil then, we use that in, uh, that's in our teeth spray for the dairy cows. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a fly repellent, so we don't use any fly control on the cows at all. That's, so they're getting that twice a day. So that, that's what that's about. Hi, cheers, Bruce. I was, I was interested. Do you find the populations vary throughout the year? Yeah, they do. So you have different why? species. What, why? why is that? You, you have why? different species arrive at different times of the year. Um, there's some will, will arrive in the early spring, there's some mid late summer and some into the autumn and some over winter. Um, and so you'll have different, I, I know in, in March and April you have, um, you have uh, Sphalacticus, which is a little small little golden beetle and it looks quite spectacular. If you notice at that time of the year the dung pats can turn into paper. Um, 
and then the borrowers then don't come until late, uh, mid to late summer time, generally speaking, um, and some of them will overwinter as well. So yeah, that's, hope that answers the question. Yeah. One more. Um, what do you do for flu control at all? There's no mention of flu control products on there. Yeah, so um, luckily we haven't had flu on the farm for quite a number of years. We did have, um, and we've, as part of our regulations, we, we've had to remove uh, all livestock from waterways. And also when I came home, um, there were sheep on the farm, and I told my dad that it's either me or them. And I think getting rid of them, honestly, I think it had, had an effect. I think they were carrying over a fluke over the winter. Um, so it, it actually just disappeared, to be honest. Um, would the dung beetles help? Well, they would, of course, help. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not easy, to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, but I suppose, that, that, I suppose another point, uh, ICBF, Irish Cattle Breeders Federation, have now put on an index onto all the bulls in the studs uh, in terms of liver fluke uh, genetic merits, which is done through genomics and through uh, factory kill, kill sheets. So there's, there's certain bulls that we just, we, we just won't use in our area, just for that risk. Thanks. Okay. Perfect, thank you very much, Bruce.